Checking one, two. Matt, can you hear us? There we, there we go. How you doing, Matt? Glad you could join us. Yeah, thanks so much. Adrian. Adrian. Hello. Hello. Oh, we oh, can't, we hear, can't Matt. hear Matt. Oh, is that work? Can you hear me? Is that working? Okay. Yes, we can yes, hear, we you can hear you now. But Matt, but if, Matt you if you can mute, you're not talking. Yeah, there we go. Because we get some feedback in the in the house. I mean, I know that I probably don't really have to ask any questions because you guys are going to have plenty. Uh, but maybe my first question might be to Adrian. Not so much a question, but can you tell me about tangential logic? Uh, can you be more specific? <laughs> uh, like connecting different things together and stuff? Indeed. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess um, all, the other reason why I gave a very short answer this morning because was be about um, like the project that wasn't, that is or isn't within the film was uh, originally I started, um, it was going to be very, uh, I guess, conceptual um, and austere because uh, other things that I had made and submitted didn't get into <laughs> festivals. So I, so I went and saw them. I, I would go to like, you know, experimental stuff and it was very austere <laughs> and conceptual. And, you know, I'm not against that. I mean, I've, so, many films I've been blown away by, even if they were just boring. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> not all of them, but certainly some. Uh, what's this, uh, James Benning's Deseret. That was like, that was the influence on this one. Um, yeah, I probably, I saw it on film, luckily. I, I couldn't watch that on um, a digital format for sure. But uh Okay, tangential logic. So yeah, so I was originally just gonna, I was just originally just doing like um, the the spirally things and stuff, and then I was like, okay, I'll put in like the history of TV, and then it just it just went everywhere. It spiraled out. Wait, the the um, history of TV. Yeah. Well, I was like, because I didn't know, you know, I had studied whatever film theory in, in undergrad, and there's all this stuff about medium specificity, and I was like, you know, I don't know, I don't have no idea how TVs work, but they were the most interesting like medium to me at the time so i kind of started digging around and then okay as far as tangential logic um i think yeah it's for me it's a question of narrative um i think a lot of films that i liked growing up or probably when i was more, more around a teenager that's when you know all those like more perros and stuff like i don't know just all those yeah. movies showed up um and uh thinking of complexity and maximalism as a type of um, first as a type of narrative. And then um, that's fun. Um, and then also kind of as an affect uh, in a way of just like experiencing a way of sort of reflecting on our world and sort of how we may experience things um just from all the information and stuff so so yeah i think it was a, a way of like how do i make this into something that's fun interesting mostly legible yeah but doesn't need to be 100 percent legible because like you know sans soleil uh syriana i still think is a really interesting um film that came out of that period like um twin peaks i don't know it's just stuff like i did not get it all the first time and it was fun to go back and rewatch it again but if it's completely illegible or like 50 percent, then, then then you might be running into an issue <laughs> okay that's uh yeah i don't know well that, well it, to some it does seem to some extent that tangential logic and cybernetics mm -hmm. goes together very well uh, mm -hmm. Definitely. And, you know, in terms of cybernetics, yeah. are you a cybernetician, in uh, this, at least as the director of this particular piece? That is a really interesting question. Yeah, I didn't actually think about that, um, that they're kind of, I mean, that was their like 50s utopian thing. Um, it's called the Macy Conferences. 
um, and a bunch of like yeah, um, Margaret Mead and Norbert Wiener, who's the main guy behind cybernetics. I think uh, I'm pretty sure John von Neumann went to a few of them. He was probably one of the most evil people to participate in uh, human existence in the United States, at least. Um, and uh, truly like the evil Einstein. <laughs> like, But uh, um what was I going to say? Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of doing the same thing, which is like putting all these different things together and seeing how they connect. Um, but I think there's, I think cybernetics as a movement, especially Norbert Wiener stuff, like it's kind of sad reading about him. Like he, he really, he really suffered from anxiety. Um, incidentally, his dad, um, they were like, I think Jewish Czech emigres. Um, and his dad and it, it was as i sort of mentioned very violent but he also um was actually trying to set up like independent like communes basically like make these like semi-socialist homesteads um and so uh sorry i'm going on but uh anyway the point is like i think that there was never a true ethics behind cybernetics um and that and or there there was, but it was really was behind the curtain was the U S military. Um, and so some of these, uh, who else was there? Um, the Gregory Bateson, who's another interesting example of that, who was really big in environmentalism was, um, I think he, he was Margaret Mead's yeah. married. Margaret Mead, yeah. Yeah. And definitely worked with the CIA and, um, and it's like responsible for like 80% or like maybe a hundred percent of like, like white environment, liberal environmentalism. Um, so it's like, they kind of just didn't, they just um, weren't comp competent and didn't have like sort of a, um, those answer those questions hard enough um, or didn't ask them. Um, but I don't think the effort in and of itself is like evil. They just kind of like realized that way too like it like i like i think robert wiener like r literally realized because he was trying to like open stuff up with russia and russian scientists and that kind of thing and then he just was like like my god what have i done and then and like died <laughs> a heart attack um anyway yeah yeah I, I mean i couldn't help but think of the ccru at, out of the university of warwick uh nick land sadie plant mm -hmm. cybernetic mm -hmm. uh research and uh, there's a there's a there's a guy that worked with them named David Cole, who wrote about the the India Pakistan border, mm. and and he used that as a way to talk about axiomatic thinking, mm. right? So yeah. the so the idea that we can take something to be true, mm. just take it to be true, and then follow it, right? Mm. Follow that line of logic, follow that like causal thread, even if the underlying principle, the axiom itself, might be absurd, right? And that's how how I kind of felt about guano yeah. by the end of this piece, right? That's yeah. like this absurd axiom. But if we follow the bird shit, like we can get somewhere that uh, tells us about the world mm -hmm. in a way that we wouldn't have understood it otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it can be both deeply personal, deeply effective, but also speak to global geopolitics, yeah. right? And the military industrial yeah. complex. So I think that was a really fascinating approach but to also bring the axiom in at the end there, like to destabilize even maybe our own thinking mm -hmm. about what this was all about. You know, you kind of reveal yeah. it's all about bird shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I really like, um, I really like, big, I just love detective movies. I literally love, I love mystery movies. I, um, uh, effort fake. If people have seen that, love that um so but you know it could also be yeah like like the move i'm doing is simple in a way but that i guess that was kind of the thing like let's yeah um if we can try to nail this down or something and make it even crazier it's it, it's definitely not simple <laughs> <laughs> nothing you did there i don't think could be described as simple uh, matt i am given to understand that you understand deleuze and um, I don't. I, don't. <laughs> I try. <laughs> um, you know the. Um, yeah, I. 
I worked on this film during um, during like the initial COVID lockdowns, and um, you know I, I'm I'm here in New York and um, sort of you know just not leaving my apartment for basically like months and. Um, I, uh, right before COVID started, um, in a period of like five years, um, several people really close to me um, passed away um, and uh, unexpectedly and family, friends, um, and it kind of, it, uh, it started making me think about just like the ways that, uh, yeah, the, the thing that came to mind for me was like, um, you know, becoming invisible, um, you know, becoming nomadic, all of these terms. And like, um, I had a, um, a friend who was like saying to me, and I, I still don't know how I feel about this, but like in a way, death and the digital things that we accumulate as part of our lives actually, you know, are reminders and, um, you know, maybe even like placeholders in some way or, you know, tokens of people that, have passed away and um I don't, yeah like connecting that to Deleuze for me seemed odd but also comforting <laughs> in in some way especially like just dealing with like loss and and grief and also all of the the loss that was going on at the time um and so that yeah that just sort of started for me this kind of journey of like how do I reaccess remnants of these people that, you know, are, are no longer around. And um, I don't know, the it, a, after thinking through this and sitting with that for a while, like the actual ashes of the person um, started to seem just like irrelevant. It was like the voicemails and the text messages and, you know, the, the act of like pretending or imagining what it would be like to drive, uh, you know, to this person's house, um, you know, when I couldn't and, you know, deliver in some way they're you know them to this this place um you know that was their home um that just it seemed like the most urgent thing i could work on i guess while covid was happening and so that's sort of where that that's where that came from um and just like having a ton of time on my hands so yeah that was that was sort of the origin of that film but deleuze was kind of like an accident i i read i had to read deleuze in graduate school and um just there were things oh, we all have to. Yeah. <laughs> the obligatory Deleuze uh, curriculum. Can you, can you mute him in a um, um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Can, can you stay muted? Because you're echoing in the room. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I was going to ask you, uh, like this, the method of transportation, right, of the object uh, in your piece and the method of navigation right, the technology that you are like navigating the world with and transporting this object with has, to me at least, it had this like extreme feeling of ambivalence. And I wonder if that's, because what you just described is actually not what I expected to hear. Like urgency is not what I felt. And so I wonder about that. Like, what is this kind of tension between urgency and ambivalence? Yeah, there was, there was, um, there was like in, in making that film, it, it kind of, it came from a place of this kind of resignation of like not being able to do this. And also this like resi, I mean, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about like all these things that we were promised about like what, you know, the two thousands would bring, like what, you know, the sort of like utopia, right. This like false idea of, you know, the, this new millennium would bring all these wonderful things. And, you know instead it's like we're facing you know a plant on fire and and it just the kind of like it it really was like disillusionment and sort of reckoning with that i think in 2020 and then in 2021 again and and still and so that it kind of i don't know it, it felt like in in doing it in this way just you know by putting an urn basically into google street view it just kind of for me, just it felt like um, I don't know this kind of like you know <laughs> sort of like fuck you to <laughs> you know the like the, the like promises and like you know this sort of fantasy that was brought up about what 
what 2020 would be like, you know, back in 1999. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I think it's a little tongue in cheek, I guess. Um, but that's where, yeah, there is definitely a tension there. Thanks. Thanks. Questions for our filmmakers, Devin. Is, ah, the mic is coming. Hi. Um, hi, Matt. Good to see you. Um, I love both of these films so much. Um, one thing I was thinking about, I'm not sure. I feel like definitely with Adrian's film it applies, but I was thinking about this in particular with the title sequence at the end of your film, Matt, was the notion of play in the work and the way you structure the, the title, like having these letters flow by in this very tactile, almost like, it reminded me of like being a child, like playing with like building blocks and it's kind of like very intimate gestural thing. And it, yet it's still very, I mean, a piece of silence. So there's this quietness and this aspect of play to it. And obviously hearing more of the, this coming from this place of like grief and navigation that we end up into this sort of this moment. And I feel similar in, in Adrian's work where there's in a very different way, there's a, this aspect of of navigation of grief of of a maybe more legible joy but like ending this really more silent moment where joy and play are still there but there's also this quietness and i'd be curious to hear you both speak to that um yeah um yeah i think that was like for me a big part of the process of making it um like I said, I started from uh, just as an idea and then I was trying to like forcibly make it, like I said, like very austere, very rigid. And it's still, it still has that, even though I'm saying, you have to just complain about those other movies, but it's clearly like, that's just how it came out. But, um, but then I was watching it or showing it to like close friends and I was like, fuck, this is really boring i can't even i can't <laughs> like um you know because it's already getting to like 18 minutes and stuff and it's like this is just droney and there needs to be something you know like the personal stuff and then the humor i was like trying to push that in there a little bit but it was still just holding so it's kind of just like a like personal process with myself of like releasing and kind of um what is it like stepping out of my like my safety box and stuff and and definitely with the encouragement of like just other friends who i don't know are that's a lot of their practice you know so i think i owe a lot to them matt yeah i um hi hi devin it's really good to see you <laughs> um i wish i was there um yeah, the play is um, there. There was a moment when, like, I um, and I think again, it was like when you know when COVID was was happening, um, and you know, just like being glued to this thing, and um, you know, I, I had been interested in sort of like what you know how, especially with like film in particular, and how film and a digital screen can kind of like fight against each other and dance and all of this. Um, I also like, I found that my, so I'm, I'm dyslexic and I found that, it, and especially when I'm stressed, um, you know, I, I, that's like really when it becomes a problem. And so I started to like, I, I start. I found myself starting to read in this like very like syllable based way and write in the same way. Um, and so like, and, and also the word millennium for me has always just been a really hard word to spell. Um, and so in making this film, I learned how to spell millennium finally. Um, but I, I like, I, I wanted to kind of like, just put that like both like frustration of, you know, what it felt like working with the written word in, in that moment. Um, and also like, I don't know, there's something like, so, um, I don't know. I, I, Helvetica, I've always just had a hard time with as a font. I love it and don't like it at the same time. And so seeing this block text do that um, 
for me just felt like again like another false promise of the millennium it's like this is what you get you know like <laughs> you get helvetica scrolling infinitely across your phone and so yeah that's sort of that's where it uh sort of fits in Thank you both for these works. Um, Adrian, Adrian, I wanted to ask um, and compliment you on your writing, which I think is very successful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, especially in terms of uh, the levity that I think you were searching for um, and just in sort of guiding guiding the audience and through your process and, and how you see these things connected. And I'm hearing I'm hearing you start to explain some of the like reflexive elements of the piece, but um, you know, with your family's connection to Honduras, like there there's a world in which or a version in which in this film your anxiety wasn't a part of it. And I'm really curious, like how you were able to sort of like connect the dots between like the form of the thinking that you're doing and and, and allowing us to see in the film and like this revelation of like your own process of those spirals. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for including it. And I'm just curious like how and when and why that became part of your process. Uh, yeah, like the the stuff about anxiety. Um, yeah, I started, um, I mean, the big thing for me was it just seemed so, so the anxiety stuff came, it wasn't in before the Honduras stuff. Um, and because most of what I was doing with the analog video was like um, feedback loops. And I was like, this is just too weird that I'm doing this stuff with feedback loops. And it's like essentially like the first, you know, word you kind of read in, um, you know, that kind of thing about, uh, yeah, like anxiety, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, like workbooks and that kind of stuff. So I was like, what is the connection here? And then I forget how that kept going. But yeah, I mean, on, like straight up also and not, um, I, w I wouldn't have done that on my, on my own. I mean, really, it was like my ex-partner and like some of my, you know, close friends who are like, you know, just not cis hat dudes who were like, you got to include this personal stuff, man. Like, or just like, just keep doing it. Like, I see threads there, keep pulling it out. Um, and then, so there were kind of, I forget where the big first thing with the anxiety stuff came in. I think. I mean, definitely, like, the thing where I'm in the TV studio, that was for one of my friends who's a filmmaker, and it was, like, for her, like, TV class and stuff. And she and I have, you know, have had many long mental health discussions. So that started. That wasn't, like, that, how, t talking about this stuff wasn't, like, without, none of that was planned. Like, I was, just came in and was going to talk about the movie, and it got kind of boring. And I think that, having that, and I was like, shit, I could use this in the thing, and that could Tie, help tie some of this stuff together and then the honduras stuff I, I i just when i was reading about rca um i was like united fruit was part of it like what the fuck and so those kind of just and it sort of just followed the threads there and then like that picture that of uh, that's like entitled like looking east from the wireless tower in puerto mm -hmm. Castilla. it's like i just saw that like one day randomly like at my grandma's house i was like what's that what's going on here so i don't know yeah the threats just kind of came together but yeah is that a good answer Great. um thanks to you both those are both phenomenal films uh and i wanted to follow up a little bit on that that question adrian um as I was, I was sitting watching your film, I was thinking about how so much of it's about like totalizing systems um, and a kind of like logic of paranoia where like everything fits in perfectly and it all ties up neatly and it's this thing that you can't escape. 
Um, but it isn't, it doesn't feel inescapable, right? Like there's there, you, you end, you give us hope at the end that there's something outside of the system. But I think through it, there's also a commitment to a kind of politics of repair, like living within the wreckage of this system that you have shown us how it's built in order to help us figure out the cracks in it. And I'm curious how that felt while you were working on it, um, where you found, wh where, what you found reparative, right, in the process of sketching out such a, a dark total system. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I remember I had this kind of resentment. I feel like it's probably come out like just of like, um, like, okay, I'm making the wrong kind of work. It needs to be, yeah, more just like, like, you know, austere dude <laughs> stuff. I don't like, I don't know what else to call it. Like, um, and, uh, like, you know, um, and then, and, and a big thing too, I was like, I was like, you know, these guys who just like are only into video art and these, and like, you know, do all this like cable, like circuit bending and like video mixing and stuff. And they're all like, you know, wear all these really skinny jeans and they're really, they're really mean. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we all know these guys. <laughs> Some of my best friends. Well, no, that's not true. <laughs> but you know, we're all humans. And, um, <laughs> I should probably just go to therapy. I'm just scanning. <laughs> yeah, therapy is great. Um, it takes. It can take a while though. Um, so, <laughs> uh, no, but to get to that, like, I, yeah, I had this kind of resentment. And I kept trying to be like, yeah, these machines are like, you know, like American, this is like crypto Nazi, like technology. And we're like fetishizing it. And like, it's really fucked up and people need to know that. And, th but then I was like, but this, I really have fun with this. Like, this is like relaxes me and it's, it, it can be difficult, but just as like this creative practice. And I was like, no matter how much, I tried to just make this like super dark brooding, like, you know, whatever, Adam Curtis thing, or I don't know, just like Harbinger of Doom, No Way Out. Um, uh, yeah, like it, it just was, it was like, it was like, that's not fun. And like, I do literally enjoy this. Like this is that, this it was weirdly like helping me with my anxiety. And so that's gotta be part of the story somehow. Um, and if I don't include that part, then probably just, you know, doing what they're doing in a different way. <laughs> so. what, one moment. I just, Matt, I wanted to let you respond to that one as well. This idea of like there being something reparative there, because I think that your piece has the same kind of a tendency toward it, right? Uh, especially when we're talking about systems and yeah. systems during COVID. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, there. I mean, there's like kind of this, um, I don't know, like restoring something or like, you know, I think um, like like resenting in some ways, I think what we're presented with as like a set of possibilities, whether that's like, you know, like the, I, I think like, you know, with with technology, especially, I think, you know, like looking at the history of how, you um, I mean, how how violent so much of uh, you know the history of you know you know I mean and like the machoism around like you know the, the development of a lot of like computer technologies and the culture of you know like Silicon Valley and all of that. I think like I don't know, feeling as though even though those tools aren't personal, um, you know they or they're not like created in a way that feels personal. I think being able to reclaim them and sort of acknowledge that like. Google Maps can be intimate in some way or like can have like traces even of intimacy um, or that you can like remember some part of like, you know, a flash of a memory just by going down like a street or, you know, feeling as though you're accomplishing something by taking, you know, these like digitized ashes somewhere that like maybe, I don't know, there's like some kind of reclaiming that can happen there or that like these technologies aren't just you know, all belonging to Elon Musk and that like we do have, you know, like, 
that like they 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 can become ours in some way. Um, yeah, even if they just end up in a sixteen millimeter film, it's like maybe <laughs> maybe there's like some kind of reclaiming of it in that in that sense. Um, yeah, the the idea of repair I think is really um, really resonant just in terms of like what I think a lot of us are trying to do with our work and like kind of making sense right of like what like all everything that's going on around us. So yeah, it's a really and and Adrian really enjoyed seeing your film. So thank you for. No man, no, I, man really, I really. Like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and, and like and the like first frame of mats, I was like, oh yeah, I love this. Like lush, this that the silent. I don't know. I was I was like, this is such like a good pairing because it's like I really enjoy watching that kind of stuff and like just learn learn from it because it's like so different and interesting and like it's such good like attention to like texture and, and subtlety um, and economy of time. Still working on that. <laughs> well, I, I I really love that idea, Matt, that maybe it can, it can belong to us, you know, a bit. Uh, maybe it can be conditioned by us even um, through like affectively conditioned through the regularity and, you know, intentionality of use, uh, I think is a really important way of understanding how technology actually functions in our daily life rather than just as some kind of you know uber capitalist nightmare one more we have enough time for two more um i yeah, think thank you both for these fantastic films um so much to think with uh and uh i actually want to kind of ask a question uh maybe that touches on Deleuze a little bit, which is just this idea of like cinema actually performing the act of thought or as being not just a sort of like product of thought, but actually doing the work of thought. Um, Adrian, it's a thing that you say over and over again in your film, like I thought about X um, and it struck me as like, but did you think about that? And then you sit, sat down at the editing bay and um, put it together or was that thought really sort of in the process of, of putting these pieces together? Uh, and especially when you're sort of linking that to cognitive behavioral therapy and these ways of sort of like taking control of thought or, or creating structure around thought in order to contain some of those like anxious mechanisms. Um, it felt like you really achieve a lucidity in this film uh, through you know, a, a very intentional and uh, um, a, and very rigorous form of thought, but one that is about making films and working with images and not strictly just sort of like writing. So I guess I was sort of curious about how you use the timeline to do that work of thought and particularly how editing this material together sort of produced the kind of logic that this film follows. Yeah, that's... um. That's a good and tough question. Um, I think the the easy answer is that um, it was like a lot of writing. Uh, the writing was like the hardest part for sure. There's some stuff that came from journals before. There's lots of things that, um, I mean, I was probably just also borrowing from Sans Soleil, like, you know, the inner, the, he wrote me and I was like, he didn't write you. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote or you thought about that. <laughs> um, uh, so then I was, you know, <laughs> putting my own, not even twist on that. I was just like, you know that but but at the same time obviously like i owe a ton to that um the the extreme innovation and poetry of that of that film um and cadence um as far as the editing and and writing basically um so time consuming because it involved just like um going having to do back and forth so i kind of like write every write stuff record it on my iphone put it on my computer try to put it into the thing see stuff that worked or didn't match that's where i'm like i i don't even know if i can like i don't remember specific moments of like writing stuff there were like flurries of writing i do know that i 
worked on the opening for like four months or something like just the opening two paragraphs not a word of that appears there and then finally when i kind of like loosen things up a bit that's why i think maybe i was kind of just like more directly just using that stuff like but 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 and finding these fragments and where that kind of worked with images and um finding the rhythm of images and then finding this kind of basically writing a lot and then um cutting it cutting it down yeah there's probably originally like i don't know at least twice as much maybe three or four times as much writing and then just like cutting yeah cutting so much out which is crazy yeah there's a lot is it does that answer kind of okay okay yeah up here okay yeah thank you so much both of you uh thinking you know it seemed like there's probably a lot that was just said that covers the question, but thinking about the discussion of the Logopoeia and the ideas and so on, just finding you know incredible vitality in the choices with the colors and the music and the um, you know somebody used the word levity and how you know that and, and then I was curious about the thread through how you made decisions around certain. When, when something followed the next thing. I wasn't sure of the narrative. Was it an emo emotional narrative? It seemed to be adhering a lot at the end with the birds and the, you know, the kind of logic of that. But I, you know, again, I've used this phrase a lot in my own colors in the mechanism of concealment. So the cult, you know, that was very vibratory for me. And um, and then maybe the length, how you decided on editing, how short or long would be, you mentioned cadence, but just interested in that and then the span it's so archival it seems to be set you know i feel like i'm here in the 50s i'm here in the 40s i'm here in the 30s and uh, uh i heard gregory bateson 50 years ago at naropa and thinking about his story and the way you have a little bit of joanne kiger the poet in descartes and i think i heard you mention bellinas did i mm -hmm, bellinas yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. that's a big yeah, oh, yeah, for a lot definitely. of poets and so on. So there was a lot of poetry in this sort of cut up editing, the music, the highs and lows. And so when you talk about gloom or whatever, it's a gloomy thing. And I really, you know, with all respect to your own, you know, cognitive realities and all that, which is, I think it's great that you included that. And again, to, you know, this discussion about repair and so on, because that's kind of the theme of our time. How do we, uh, you know, woman up sorry <laughs> so anyway something a little bit about the 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 command of the editing and certain kinds of things it just seems so as and it sounds very very time consuming the uh archive at the end is just incredible and the research and all that so very very appreciative it just has another kind of form you know it's like more like poetry thank you that was definitely yeah the intent um yeah there's still some parts where um i was just so nervous about uh how long it would be because it, it was so before it was like even faster and it could use a little bit more like some breathing room for sure um but as far as yeah figuring out the order uh, the order of things figuring out like yeah the sequencing um uh very time consuming but i think maybe the most effective in the end was like well one rule one thing i started with was like okay this is just going to be easier if i go i essentially write this chronologically and it can have like a prologue and an epilogue um and then i can include like images from interwoven images from other time but basically the narrative is essentially just straight chronological um and i was like is that cheating to do that but then i was like okay whatever <laughs> i need some some um organizing principle and then thinking about okay i have these like three or four locations i didn't even know like i found out about swan island like halfway through and i was like okay this is the kind of sort of the clincher and then i have you know three or four and basically using these you know just what i feel like are fairly simple rules of um narrative <laughs> maybe not that simple but what did i look at um i looked at some films and like books uh or like comic books even um 
that we're introducing a lot of characters and plots at once. I mean, I actually even think something like um, Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, like, are, yeah, I mean, they're these huge, um, they seem to have pretty simple narratives because they're so, like, culturally, or just, like, just embedded in our culture. Um, but there's kind of a point where there's, like, three or four different storylines going on at once. Um, and then you kind of see that, I feel like, used a lot in popular culture. So I was kind of, like, worked backwards on how to just, like, do the, get the pacing right with that and create tension and also just with the go with the images so have older stuff always be switching between colors and older stuff newer stuff that kind of thing yeah yeah i mean i think it's a it's a brilliant performance right like and it feels like kind of like a whirly gig a whatchamacallit like a a rube goldberg machine that like you set it all up and then you like press the play button and it starts to oh, starts that. to whir that, right yeah. and spin and spiral <laughs> and unravel like all over the world in yeah, some way like yeah. you pull at the threads and yeah. at one point it becomes completely structurally unstable right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like but somehow yeah, yeah. you stick it back together again with bird shit <laughs> yeah. but uh that that does we got to wrap it up but there is going to be a conversation and a performance so a, a performance and a conversation on documentary performance on friday morning which I think uh, will have some resonances with with the works here. Uh, so don't don't miss that one. Uh, I should also mention that you can uh, rate both of these films for the audience award. If you reserve tickets, you'll get an email. Please do that because it is important for artists to get recognition. And that's why we have an awards system, not because they're fighting against each other, but because we want to recognize artists for great work. So make sure that you that you uh, use the power in your little phone and vote and other than that is there anything else i need to mention louisa great thank you all so much for being here thank you so much matt awesome to have you here virtually thank you, thank you adrian thank you.